Welcome back to Next Gen Console Watch, our new show covering all the news and rumors on the upcoming Next Gen Consoles. I'm Damon Hatfield. Joining me this week is Ryan McCaffrey, host of Howdy. IGN's Xbox Podcast, Podcast Unlocked. And we are also joined by a very special guest this week, head of Xbox himself, Phil Spencer, has joined the show. Phil, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me here. First time on. I'm, yeah, uh, I'm excited. Time. I'm ready to watch. Let's do it. Uh, let's watch the Next Gen Console, Xbox we're gonna, Series We're going to console watch. You yeah. guys have already uh, revealed a lot about the Series X. We've got the full specs, the design. We know about new features like quick resume and smart delivery. We have the launch window and a big launch day exclusive. But there's a lot of runway left going up, uh, leading up until the launch of this thing. What can we expect? What are the sort of the beats that we're going to be seeing throughout the year? We start talking more about games, or are there still hardware features to reveal? Yeah, I mean, obviously we're we're dealing with unprecedented times right now. Um, you know, people are working from home, safety and security of our teams, primarily important, um, and really the community all up. And frankly, the fact that we're all sitting here on this, uh, at our homes doing this mm -hmm. is, is a good sign of that. So uh, after the cancellation of E3, we've been sitting and watching um, how our teams have been making progress and building a plan uh, to continue to disclose more and more and try to be as transparent as we can. I think you, you hit it. Uh, we know that teams want to see games. We know that's the thing that we've, we've shown what it looks like. We've given it a name. We've given it a date. We've kind of gone through all of the guts that are there. I think we do have a, a couple more hardware things to go do, but it's really about now pivoting to the games. Before the E3 cancellation, our plan with the, uh, the unveil that we did with Austin and Digital Foundry was to give ourselves spots so the next we could just go have uh, a big game speed at E3, and we're, we'll we'll continue to, to kind of work on those plans as, as things move around, but uh, lots more to come, and mm. we're definitely very excited about the games we're going to get to show. Phil, uh, analysts are talking about, well, is will there be delays with the hardware? What about scarcity? So uh, why talk to analysts when we've got we've got uh, the, the source itself here? But, I mean, you know, in, in reality, you know, it's, you just talked about it, you addressed it. We are facing a nationwide crisis here that is that has heavily impacted the way everyone works. So um, what is sort of Microsoft's current position as far as the your workflow and the, the current plan towards towards the fall launch and whether or not that's, you know, in jeopardy or or still on track or, or where you guys stand now? Yeah, as a gaming leadership team, we're having conversations almost daily. Uh, as teams are learning, how does work from home impact their productivity? What work can they get done? Now on the hardware side, and I think Satya came out and talked about this a little bit uh, a couple weeks ago, we're seeing the factories in China come back online. Uh, we, feel, we feel pretty good about those plans. We have hardware testing that happens, that some of that happens in China, but a lot of that happens here. It's the reason we're all doing take home. It's important that we really get the kind of miles on our take home unit so that we can test out the new software features as well as the hardware. Getting the platform right and done, getting the games, that's probably um, the biggest variable between now and launch. Uh, and just watching that as the, the teams are making their progress, uh, keeping their safety and security at the top. Like that, right? We're building video games here. We're not, uh, we're not healthcare workers. We're not frontline. Uh, Got to keep it all in perspective. Uh, as Liz Hammer and I, Lynn run, Liz runs our platform and hardware team, I've uh, been talking through this. We feel good about right now about our plans, but um, we also just have to know that we're going to learn every day uh, what, how this experience is hitting people. Would you say it's, it's more likely for games to be delayed rather than hardware? Yeah, I think the software part all up just given the, the timelines that we're seeing is probably the, the most challenging right now. Uh, that said, uh, you're, you're still kind of on the ramp back up in the factory, so we'll kind of see on the hardware side. Uh, but, you know, you think about the software, there's all the software our customers see. You know, they, they, they go to Game Pass, they see the dash, they have all these things, Xbox Live, that they're going to expect. Um, there's also the software development kit that we have to give to our third-party partners now because right. they're working on games. That's, that's impacted, obviously, as these teams are figuring out how to build their XDK from home and ship it to the partners. Our partners are working from home. So how is that feedback loop happening? It's not quite happening as fast as it was. Uh, but definitely if I look at the complexity now, I would say software is probably a little more complex um, than hardware. 
that said, I'm incredibly proud of the work that the teams are doing. Uh, many people on our teams have kids at home who are now schooling from home. So while they're also trying to get their work done, uh, you know, you've got a house full of people who are probably getting tired of being under the roof and seeing each other all day. Uh, so it's just a, a time where I think empathy um, and ensuring that we're all there for each other is important. I, I'd be remiss if I just didn't talk about how much traffic we're seeing on the network right now all up. Sure. Not directly related, obviously, next gen, um, but it does show just the role that gaming plays in the industry. And and for us, you know, even that time we get face to face with each other in the office and this feeling of isolation as I sit in front of a a webcam for nine hours each day. We're just, you know, how are, are we as, as, as humans kind of react to this process as it drags out is, is something that we're, we're just monitoring. Phil, are you seeing a spike in Game Pass subscriptions at all as a result of the, the quarantines and the, the working from home and shelter in place? Sort Everything's up, Ryan. Yeah. Everything's up. <laughs> like it's, Minecraft is huge. Game Pass is huge right now. We're seeing Hardware sales are, are strong right now. And it's as people are thinking about, because gaming's a good value. When you start doing the kind sure. of cost per dollar, um, I could rent a movie, I could buy a movie or something, and hey, I can go and get a, a video game console. Uh, and yeah, it'll sound like I'm a, you know, a salesman here, but if you buy a video game console, get a subscription to Game Pass, you've got hundreds of games for your family to go play. Um, so everything is going, going up right now. I mean, it's, it's not something that, like, we're, we're very careful that we're not exploiting the situation. I think what we're seeing is just what game, the role that gaming normally plays in a household, and it's amplified right now, now as more people um, are at, at home. But yeah, Game Pass is uh, incredibly strong right now, and it's great to see that it can bring so many great games to our, our customers. You know, we talked about this issue a little bit last week on the show uh, about the possibility of a hardware shortage or scarcity at launch. And we actually polled the IGN audience. We asked them, uh, if there's a scarcity issue, how far are you willing to go to get a next-gen console at launch? Uh, the options were, whatever it takes, I'll camp out, I'll wait in line, I'll be there, uh, or I'll just wait until they're back in stock. 10% said they were willing to do whatever it takes, camp out, while 88% said they're fine with just waiting until stock is available. So. That's good to know. It's good data. I mean, it is this generation, at least for us, will be different uh, because we've, we've talked about things like smart delivery. Uh, I think the console industry of old tried to create these real step functions between the generations where go take everything you did before, put it in a, in a cardboard box and throw it in the closet and go plug in the new thing and everything is new. Um, and when we look at the growth in gaming, we see so many of these huge games that are going to be played for decades. I mean, Minecraft being one of them is over a decade long now. Old now. Um, so I, I think this transition will be a little bit different. So that, that answer actually doesn't surprise me because mm. um, we've talked about smart delivery. It's not like you have to worry about it, whether you buy a game now, what version of the game did you buy? We're going to say with smart delivery, you bought the version for the hardware that you have um, mm. and you're, you're going to have that game there. So um, I could understand why certain people might say I, I would wait. And I, I think it's a smart decision. Now, Phil, you, you talk about, uh, about consoles being, gaming being good value, hmm. and, and you're, you're, you're prepping right now a, a very powerful new console in the form of the Series X. Everybody's speculating how much is this thing going to cost. What are sort of your internal constraints around price? Sort of what, what are kind of the boundaries that you're working within that'll kind of, that kind of determine where the price will ultimately land for the consumer and what your sort of price tolerance is as far as profits or do you, do you take a, do you take a little hit on it for the, the, the long-term market share? Like to, to just to go into polls again, we're, we're we love polls on this show. <laughs> yeah. We pulled the IGN audience. This is just data IGN. Driven. Com. This is data driven. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, the, the front page of IGN. So all, all of our users, no matter what platform they're playing on. And, and we asked, uh, what are you willing to pay for the new consoles? And we had yeah. 40, 44% were in the 400 to 500 range. They said that's, yeah. that's, what, they're, that's what they're willing to do. 11% 500 to 600, 13% saying price is no object. And this oh, is uh, 43,000 43, responses. So, you know, wow. not, not the whole community, certainly, but a, but a reasonable sample size there. Yeah. Now we do our own customer research. Um, and we know that the value of the console has to be there. Uh, we had certain people that are looking for you know, peak performance and they want to be there day one. 
Other people, this is just one of the things that discretionary income um, that they use to entertain their family. I also think we would just remit, be remiss if we didn't talk about the economic realities that could be here um, next mm -hmm. fall. I mean, yeah. not to be all doom and gloom, we saw the jobless claim numbers last week, or yeah, last week that came out. Uh, I, don't, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I think gaming is a luxury, uh, and we should all just understand that. Uh, when we look back at say 2008 and what happened with gaming, gaming tends to be durable. It seems that people see it as a value and they'll continue. But obviously, people have to take care of their families first in, in what they're doing. So I think there's a lot of things that all of us are probably watching right now as we think about the right price and the right offering. You know, we have Xbox All Access, which is something that we expect to go big with um, at the launch of the consoles. Xbox All Access is our, our program with Live and, and uh, Game Pass and the, the hardware all in a monthly fee um, can help some people kind of lessen the, the single impact um, of a purchase. We think that's gonna be an important thing for us um, next fall as well. But it's like a day-by-day -day exercise right now just watching what's happened. In the in the usual run-up to a console launch, say we're eight or nine months out, would would you have settled on a price at this point or is it still a moving target? You know, if if, if this pandemic weren't happening, would you know the price internally and, and be confident with that at this point? Um, we always try to stay agile on, on what we're doing. And the, the, the business model for a console, you're, you're usually selling consoles like that is true. Um, and then you make up the money based on store revenue, subscriptions, accessory sales, game sales. Um, I mean, that is the business model uh, of a console. And when you look at the aspiration that you have for how many you want to sell, what your market share is, I, I, I've said this, we're getting incredible support from Microsoft. This generation, you've seen us acquire a lot of studios. I think we've built Obviously, the most powerful console we've ever built turns out to be the most powerful console this generation. Uh, we feel great about that. That We started that back in 2016 before we knew anything about the situation today. Uh, but we could only go and build that plan and that piece of hardware with complete support from the company. So decisions about pricing and investment, all these things are made hand in hand with Microsoft. And we feel really good about the support that we have. Phil, I wanted to, to bring up, I've got, I've got a, one more poll for you. Uh, okay. More poll results it's on the back of a serious question, which is, you know, we've, I've talked on my show podcast unlocked about how I feel like you guys are, are, uh, contrary to, to the Xbox one run up in 2013, you're doing, you're really doing everything right. Uh, right now, the, the messaging has been crystal clear. The, uh, the, the capabilities of the machine are, are very clear and it's a very powerful box, as you just said. Uh, so you, you're, you're, you're being very transparent. And I think you're, you're showing rather than just telling. We've heard some telling from the other guys so far, uh, but you have shown it in the form of the, the very, to me, I thought the ray tracing demo that you guys put out was extremely convincing as, as a primary benefit for what you're gonna get with the new console. You showed the, the loading times and the quick resume stuff. You know, you've done a great job of that. And uh, this is a very recent poll number uh, with 58,000 respondents, this this poll was done after your uh, tech spec reveal and after Sony's, and 43% uh, say I'm going with PS5, 26% say I'm going with Series X, and the rest of the people are divvied up between both and or just I'm sticking with my Switch for now. So certainly the competition had did very, very well this generation, and, and that's just a market reality, but kind of what, what is, uh, what do, how does that land with you when you know, you know that you're, you're messaging well and you're, you're, you've got a great box and you're delivering it well, but you know, do you see this as a, as a long game? Absolutely. I think uh, the, the competition has done a really good job this generation. I think the loyalty that their, their fans feel to the brand, uh, they've earned that. And our job is to earn earn it back for the people that have left Xbox. And as many new customers are coming in uh, to console gaming, probably no disrespect, but probably a lot that don't know about an IGN um, an IGN poll on the website. Right. Uh, it's important that we are very crystal clear in what we're building towards. That we build great value. Um, that we have features that are you can demonstrate real end user value. 
um, with that they see the difference in the games. Um, and this is absolutely a long game for us. And um, I feel like I've kind of been in this role through a generation where uh, we were far enough behind that kind of catching up was probably not real, definitely not realistic. Uh, and we are dead set on being in a position out of the gate with the right product, with a product truth uh, that really shows what we're doing. We know we have to go show great games that get people excited. And I think as we continue to tell our story, we continue to put the gamer at the center of every decision that we make, whether it's back and pat, whether it's smart delivery, whether it's the tech that's in the box, um, you know, whether it's how we treat exclusives, all of those things. Um, I think in the end, uh, we believe in our plan and, and what will happen. But we got to go earn it. There's no doubt about that. Our, our games, is our first party exclusives the last piece of the puzzle for you, Phil? Do you feel with mm -hmm. the... You know, you've got the box, you've got the services between backwards compatibility and Game Pass and Xbox Live. Are the games the, the last piece of it for you, do you think? I mean, you guys hit it. Price will be important as well. Like in the end, if you look at it, price is usually a critical, critical factor. Um, I think if we look back at this generation at the beginning, I don't think the difference was the games. If you look at the first couple of years of, of Xbox One and PS4, um, I don't think that was the, the clear difference between the two platforms. You, people have taste differences and other things, but um, at, at the beginning, I don't think that was the real difference. So I think there's a that price will be important, games will be important, but we also have to continue to tell our story. Um, the thing I loved about the beat that we did a few weeks ago wasn't us talking about us. This was, you know, Austin here, kind of he would he got his hands on the console. It was the Digital Foundry team here. And I love it when other people are talking about our the things that we built, because of course we're going to be incredibly biased in what we say. Uh, but when you have others talking about it, so the thing I can't wait for is for IGN to be playing games on the console and to yeah. be able to talk about the experience, because it's going to be much more meaningful coming from your mouths than it is, you know, this this PR guy um, sitting there kind of talking about the thing that we've been building for four years. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think it's it is the games, it's the experience, it's how trusted experts in the field talk about it. Um, how developers are talking about developing for the platform, uh, and, and frankly, the experience that they will have when people go to the store and put their own hands on it. Are there lessons learned from the Xbox One launch in 2013 that you're applying this year? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, the, the first thing is just know your customer and who mm. we're building for. And we started in on this program, 2016, saying we're going to go build the absolute console we know we can build, um, obviously the most powerful console that we could build, looking at some new technologies that we could bring to bear, things like DirectX ray tracing, um, things like the, very, the, the latency reduction work that we've done, uh, things like smart delivery, like really trying to build the experience around the gamer. When you look at all the people who play video games on the planet today, console has a lot of great things that they could bring to that overall audience. But it's also true in the other direction of more people being able to play games brings more creators in, more creators brings more creative opportunity and you get better games. Like that's the flywheel that we're trying to, we're trying to go off and create. It's, we, if, if we get criticized by things kind of behind the scenes um, by, by partners, it's, we're, we're a little disruptive to some of the traditional business models uh, that people have liked in console gaming. As an example, new console comes out and people have to go rebuy games that they wanted to go play and there's a up res or a remastered version. We come out with smart delivery and say, hey, if somebody's already bought a game, they should be able to play that game and we should deliver the right bits on the console that they own to play absolutely the best version of that game, the smart delivery, a little bit with the Xbox Play Anywhere stuff. Um, you know, cross play, cross buy, cross progression, there are, been, there, there are kind of pockets of, of console space that want to fight those things. Uh, but I think if you put the players to see the, the, the player's best interest at the center and say you, you want to build an environment around them, even when you're taking some near term kind of loss over traditional uh, console opportunity, I believe in the long run that will win. Phil, I think for me, the big difference as somebody who's who's been covering Xbox for 17 years now is uh the difference between 2013 and thus far in 2020, I guess we'll start tail end of 2019 at the Game Awards, it's confidence. Uh, I think you guys were back on your heels a lot, very defensive in 2013, whereas I think you've been very, very confident in everything you've been doing. And uh, you know, you've, you've 
been clear about everything and you've got a powerful machine, you've got Game Pass, you've got these services. So I'm kind of curious uh, if if that's something that you get a sense of internally or if that's just something I'm picking up as a as a media lackey from from the product itself. I feel it on the team. We have a term we use in Team Xbox of being humbly confident. Like I, I don't think it's about touting what we've done, but believing in what we've done. Um, and as as somebody who, who gets to lead the team right now, um, seeing the team believe in their own vision and their own product, uh, and how the top spin that creates on the development of the team is just awesome. When I, I, I told this story before, when I started in this role, the team was beaten down. It felt like they were let down by some top level messaging and, and decision making. And my job was really to kind of rally belief and um, and to build momentum. Most of the time now, when I sit down with a team, uh, Jason Ronald, Liz Hammer, Andrew Goosen, and they come in and they want to talk about uh, variable rate shading or, or, or the, the frame rate work that we're doing, they've made way more progress than I could have ever hoped they would have made in the time between the times I've seen them. And I literally have to sit there and try not to just be smiling the whole time during the meeting because I figure that's not very balanced as a, a, a head of Xbox. But the teams make are making incredible progress right now um, on what they're trying to go trying to go build, and that really comes down to belief more than more than anything. So I think you're right if you sense that. I sense it being part of the team, uh, and even decisions like doing the Game Awards, which was Cindy Walker's decision. Uh, Cindy said, "Let's go do something different. Let's go try to." to be the big news at the Game Awards. And um, and I, I think that's just a, that was a bold move and it, it required confidence and it required listening to the different voices around the table. So it's not just the same old people uh, making the same old decisions. And I think that that confidence really shines through in the form factor itself. You've touched mm -hmm. on it. I mean, this is, this is a very bold uh, console design. We haven't seen anything this kind of out there relative to the console norm, arguably since the GameCube. Right now, uh, is we've seen it torn apart in some of the the you know yeah. the digital foundry, and it's. I, I really have seen like if you look back, you guys have come a long, long way in the in the industrial design department. I mean, even from you know the original the Xbox 360 had the 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 inhaling. Uh, design and yeah. that was, if I remember correctly, that was Astro had had been the partner yeah. on the de the design firm there. And then you come internally that you know the original the Xbox One was, to me, very uh, seemingly purposely over engineered with the giant fan on top to make sure Red Ring would never happen again. But really, it was from the the S after you took over uh, the the head of the division, the S, the X, and now the Series X. It, was it a, a change of personnel? Is it just a philosophy? Like that really feels like a hard line right there between Xbox One and then from the S to now. Yeah, I'm a little bit of a pet peeve on this one because I've seen a lot of sensibilities. It was about, about same team. What we had with Xbox One uh, was a team that didn't have enough time uh, because of late binding executive decisions on certain things. Um, and this is why we started in 2016 this time around. Um, and at the same time, we started testing certain things in the market to ensure that when we got to this point, things would work. Things like, can we take our back compact catalog of games and actually have them run better on a new piece of hardware? The reason we did that with X is one, because we thought it was the right thing to do, but we already had that, you know, that when X came out, we were already in the plans for Series X. So we said, if we want this to be part of a console transition, let's take it on as a work item now for the Xbox One X to make sure that when we're delivering it part of the next gen all up, that it works. I mean, even rewinding further, and I'm a little, sorry, I'll come back to your answer. Yeah. Even the work we did on the hypervisor early on with Dave Cutler on the team to make back compat work the way it did on Xbox One is paying huge dividends for us right now. Like that is... The unsung hero is our hypervisor work and the back compat work in terms of the hardware liberation. We can make kind of not any hardware decision, but the freedom we had in making the hardware decisions that we did on Series X um, started long ago. But it's all the same team. I mean, 
If that somebody wants to go look up Dave Cutler, you should go look up Dave Cutler on the internet. He's in a computer science hall of fame. He works on Xbox. He's an awesome, awesome guy. He's like one of the early Windows. He basically wrote Windows NT by himself. Like he's a, a master computer scientist. He's the guy doing our hypervisor um, on the Xbox, the back compact team. The hardware team had the time. Um, we started early enough that we could say, here's what our goals were. Same thing on S, same thing on X. And you see Carl Ledbetter and Liz running that team, um, really delivering. So I have a little bit of a, when people try to tell me it's about a, a new team or new leadership there, it's like, no, no, no. You give a good team time and clear direction on what we're trying to go do, uh, and they can do amazing work. And Series X, we've said this looks the way it does, because we said that uh, form was going to, like, we, the form had to support the, the, what, the function that we wanted inside of the console. I thought they did a great job. We looked at other options, uh, but that was the one that Liz and the team really championed, and I think it was a good choice. Yeah, I have to agree. I think it's a really uh, sharp looking console. We're just about out of time this week, but before we go, we're going to introduce a new poll because you're right, Phil, we love polls here. Uh, we want to know which new Xbox game studio are you most excited to see an Xbox Series X game from? Is it the initiative? Is it Playground Games? Obsidian? Make sure to vote at IGN.com and we'll share the results with you. Oh, next I thought week. you were going to ask me to answer. I can't. Oh, answer. no, no. We oh, are. No, this is, we're pulling. <laughs> but impossible. uh but Phil, you can vote at IGN.com. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, if people if people want a more in-depth discussion with you and Phil, where can they find it? Ah, uh, yes. Podcast Unlocked. That interview is live now. One hour with this fine gentleman, Phil Spencer. Yeah. Uh, one hour. It's episode 437 of Podcast Unlocked. Phil, thank you so much for joining us this week. And I know I speak for everyone at IGN. We're really excited to uh, see and learn more about Xbox Series X. Thanks for the time. I really appreciate it. Stay safe. That'll Thank do you, it Phil. for this edition of Next Gen Console Watch 2020. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Ryan. We will be back next Friday, 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Eastern, with more Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5 news. See you then.